We're so gl glad you could all join us. Um, so today's class, I'm sure you guys all know, is we're going to be talking all about kelp forests and the many fabulous beings that call them home. It's such a rich and vibrant ecosystem and such an interconnected community. And I'm so excited. Julius will be guiding us through an art lesson um, and kind of teaching us more fun facts and backstories about some of these beautiful species. So with that, on that note, I'll pass it over to Julius. Hey, thank you, Maya. That's an awesome introduction. Um, yeah, I'm so excited. So welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm actually here uh, in the uh, Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil uh nations uh, territories uh, in what is uh, we sometimes call Vancouver. And uh, today it's a little cooler. We've been in the middle. I'm sure a lot of you can feel uh, we've been in a, a very much of a heat wave in, in May, which is really unusual. And that's going to be very pertinent to what we're talking about today as well. So keep that in mind as I know that we can't really ignore the heat. But I'm really excited about this um, this particular uh, webinar because uh, it touches on some really fascinating ways in which not just individual animals and plants and other beings uh, exist, but how they interact with each other. That's what's really exciting about this. It's going to be a, a wonderful uh, lesson in ecology. I'm an ecologist uh, by training initially, so this kind of thing really gets me going. Uh, and there, it's just such a wonderful story of how different beings of different kinds interact with each other and help to shape an entire ecosystem that they create as a whole. And so that's what we're going to talk about, not just one type of, of, of being, but many types. So we're going to make a fun drawing this time, and uh, it's not going to focus on just one type either. Again, there will be several uh, species in it, so this is going to be neat. You'll see some diversity. Uh, and uh, what's neat about this too is that the, the, the kelp forests are very organic. They, they change in appearance and so on. So in the drawing today, it's going to be a lot easier to do some of it because, you know, you don't have to be as precise about, you know, how the ears of this animal fit on its face and so on. There's going to be a lot more flexibility. So your drawing is going to look awesome uh, regardless of where you put the lines in many ways. Uh, so anyway, let's get going with that. Uh, I am working digitally on a tablet. You can work uh, in whatever way you like. If you have a paper, that's great. I've set up my uh, screen to be the shape of an eight and a half by 11 inch uh, letter size page. So that makes it easier for most of us. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share my screen here and we'll get to see what I've set up here. Share that. Okay, so now you should start to be able to see my screen, which should show and a preview of what we're going to be doing here today. Let's try to enlarge this a wee bit, make it a bit better here. So this is kind of what we're going to be doing, this drawing here. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's a lot of detail, but don't worry about that. We're going to deal with everything piece by piece, and it should be a lot of fun to talk about. And I just love the story of kelp forests. It is really fascinating. It's one of the most amazing stories biologically that I know of, uh, and we'll get right into the meat of it. Or uh, the, the vegetative parts of it, which we're gonna have a lot more of than, than meat in this case. Um, so with that, uh, let's get started. So kelp forests, uh, why do we call them forests? What are kelp? Kelp are, they, they're not plants. So a lot of people might think they're plants, you know, you know, you can be forgiven for thinking they're plants because they do use sunlight to make food, just like plants do. They use different pigments, and pigments are those colorful molecules inside their cells that take sunlight and transform it and then harness its energy so that it can be used to build food. But they have a different kind of, of these light harvesting pigments than plants do. Kelp are in a group of beings called brown algae. So you've heard of algae probably before. And sometimes you'll see them like sort of green scum on the bottom of, of, of containers that are full of water and left in the sun. That's one kind of algae, green algae. There are many kinds of algae. And the neat thing is that they all sort of evolved separately from each other. So we have these interesting kinds of beings that use the sun to make food and they're very different from each other. So much diversity. Kelp are one of those groups. And kelp are not just like, you know how a lot of algae and bacteria are made of single cells, right? You can't really see individual ones with your eyes most of the time. But kelp have these great big bodies. And, we're, and you can see some of these in the drawing here that we're gonna be doing. 
they are what we call multicellular. They're made of many cells, just like you and I. You and I are made of many, many cells, and they make up an entire body for us. Well, kelp are similar to that, just like plants. Plants are big enough to see. They're made of many cells. Uh, if you're in a, a, a classroom or, or, or a homeschool, you can ask your parents or your teacher to show you maybe if you peel an onion, the, the thin skin from between the layers of an onion, you look, hold it really close, you can actually see individual cells, little rectangular little dots that are shining. Those are their individual cells. But kelp are made of many, many cells, just like plants. But they evolved this multicellularity, this, this being made up of many cells independently of plants. They're an amazing group of organisms. And they're not trees technically, these ones, but they look like trees and they sort of function like trees. They stand tall in the uh, oceans, in the relatively shallow parts of the oceans, but still pretty deep compared to you, know, you or I. And so we call them forests because they make these many, many, many stems uh, standing in, in an area and they function sort of like a forest and providing this beautiful habitat for other beings. Okay. So here we go. We're going to start drawing these kelp. I'm going to remove the, the preview. And, and then we're going to start by one little bit at a time. We're going to start making this one kelp. Now we're looking at bull kelp this time. It's a particular kind of kelp that you'll find a lot of the time washed up on the shores. You've probably seen it a lot. It's uh, got these weird sort of like, like a um, kind of like a, a, a club and, uh, and then a, a long, narrow, uh, like a tentacle. And then the club also has a bunch of these, these, these spaghetti-like bits that, um, that come off it sort of like fettuccine. Uh, and that's bull kelp. And bull kelp is very common on our coasts here. And when it washes ashore, that's individuals that have lost uh, their grip on the bottom and have been basically washed out. So bull kelp. Uh, is, a, is an important one here. And we're going to start by drawing right in the middle of your page, this kind of like a balloon shape. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch here to my pencil. And I'm going to draw and just follow along where, where I am. Keep in mind where you put things on the page. Again, this is right in the middle. So we're going to draw kind of, a, kind of a balloon thing. And you're going to leave a slight, slight bit of a gap on the lower right corner. Roughly circular. This is a very important part of the kelp. Oh, by the way, kelp, these forest-like algae, uh, probably arose in the what's called the Miocene, which is a time of period that, um, that ranged several uh, million years ago, and said so probably around 5 to 23 million years ago. So they're actually really recent, these kelp forests in, on our planet. They weren't around when the dinosaurs were, uh, were as common on Earth, uh, the types that are not birds. Uh, back in the Mesozoic. These are relatively new. So this here, this round part of the bull kelp is called the air bladder or the pneumatocyst. Uh, and basically its function is like a balloon. It holds gas and that causes it to float just like a balloon would float in water. And that's really important because the kelp, this long, long tentacle like uh, uh, stem of the kelp or the stipe isn't would normally just kind of float around and maybe the, 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 the uh, kelp would settle to the bottom or whatever, but it's important for it to get sunlight. And for it to get sunlight, it needs to be close to the surface because sunlight doesn't penetrate too well through water, especially when there's a lot of stuff in the water, like during the spring and summer, when we start to get a lot of activity, a lot of animals and plants and microbes are filling the ocean in this wonderfully nutrient-rich waters, which are important for kelp to grow. They need high nutrient-rich uh, waters and cold waters, also very important. Remember that cold water is important for kelp. Um, and it's so hard for the light to penetrate that kelp needs a way to rise to the surface or it take its, its photosynthetic like leaf-like bits to the surface, so the blades. And that's what this does. This balloon-like thing raises that up to the surface. So there's the, the pneumatocyst or the air bladder. Okay. Now, from that, we're going to draw a long that tentacle part that I mentioned, which is called the stipe. It functions similarly to the, the stem of a plant. It holds things uh, up from the bottom uh, and keeps it together. So we're going to draw this long pair of lines from the balloon-like air bladder down to the lower right. Now, it's a little bit wider just under the balloon, and then it narrows. So watch how I do this. There's going to be one line coming like this, all the way out to the right corner, 
And then the other line, you see how it kind of widens a little bit and then it narrows. And this is the tricky part is keeping your lines pretty much parallel or right next to each other. So that you get this sort of more or less constant thickness. It's okay if you don't get it right, you can use an eraser, fix it up or whatever. And there's also a little bit of variation, so it's all good. But notice that it's a little bit wider at the top. The, um, the stipe, as we call it, also is hollow, so if, um, but and it has a little bit of the gas as well. Really cool fact here. And oh, by the way, uh, I have to mention that uh, a lot of the things that I've learned about kelp, I've learned by reading the, uh, the blog and writings of, um, of Jackie Hildering, the marine detective. And you might have you might have encountered her posts online and social media, and she has wonderful blog posts. I have to give her credit for such a wonderful job of presenting a highly scientifically informed, beautiful um, description of the, of the marine environments to everybody. I highly recommend you check it out. Uh, she's actually been on this uh, program before when we did the giant Pacific octopus. She was one of the panelists as well, and she has beautiful photos of kelp. And so, she did some really neat uh, sort of background research looking into what's inside this, this pneumatocyst. And in fact, the weird thing is it's not just regular air, it's carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide is that gas that, you know how you've got your fire alarms in your house and they detect smoke, but there's also a carbon monoxide detector. If, if there is um, a leak, uh, you know, there's too much carbon monoxide developed. It's not carbon dioxide, which we exhale, Carbon monoxide has one fewer oxygen and it's very poisonous to us. And so that's why we have those detectors so that we can't smell it, but we don't want to be breathing it because it's very dangerous. So the neat thing is that bull kelp produces carbon monoxide as a byproduct of its sort of uh, respiration or kind of like br our breathing. And it gathers it up and basically puts it into this, uh, into this pneumatocyst. So it produces gas, but it uses that gas because gas floats in, in, in liquid, right? And so it can use this gas inside of those things. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a, a poisonous gas, so we want to stay away from it, but it still works to pull it to the surface. So just a really neat thing about, about this kelp that way. Okay, so um, we have the, the gas-filled pneumatocyst or air bladder, and we have some gas in that stipe as well. And now we've got these wonderful, uh, what are called blades. The blades, kind of like it's named kind of like how a knife blade is long and, and thin, right? And flat. Well, it has, the kelp has these leaf-like structures. They function like leaves. They're not leaves, uh, but they function like leaves. And they look like a long, flexible blade of a knife, for example, or a sword. Um, and um, they come out from this air bladder or pneumatocyst. You're going to start to put them in by making four little bumps on the surface of the air bladder opposite the side of the stipe. So like this, there are four little bumps. And these are where the blades come out of. Okay. So this is bull kelp. Now there's many kinds of kelp and we have many kinds of kelp on our shores here on the Pacific Northwest. We have giant kelp, uh, which is laminaria, sorry, uh, macrocystis, um, well, it's also laminaria, sort of genus names. I'm a biologist, I go crazy about these kinds of uh, fascinating names that they have. Um, bull kelp is one kind. You also have sugar kelp, uh, which is uh, another weird kind that has these enormously flexible, bendy, big blades, but not the kind of long stipe or air bladder like, uh, like bull kelp. So many kinds. Um, keep that in mind because we're talking about a whole forest, a community, right? In a forest, you go into a forest on land, you see all kinds of plants on, in the undergrowth. Well, it's like that in these kelp forests too. You get all kinds of kelp all kinds of other types of algae, many kinds of, of animals that feed on them and the animals that feed on those, beautiful ecosystem, rich, diverse, very important. That's because of the presence of these kelp forests. They provide a wonderful source of nutrition and protection to many, many, many species of beings. Okay? So now we're gonna put the blades in place here. So we're gonna start with one of them. Uh, you're going to go to the, let's say, one end of one of these little uh, bumps that you put onto the air bladder. We're going to draw this uh, kind of windy, bendy piece because they're very flexible. Uh, and it's, I'm going to draw a couple of lines like this, and you'll see how it looks sort of like a snake. Winds back and forth, and it's flexible. And it tends to, it's flat, totally flat. 
very, very thin flat, kind of like, think of like a fettuccine uh, noodles, very much like that, but thinner. But it is, it does have some thickness to it. It's just that it's very wide. So it looks thin overall. And basically this thing flops around in the current. So there's ocean currents, right? The ocean's waters are always moving. And as that current pushes the kelp, the air bladder raises all of these blades to the surface, and then the current flattens them out into a long, long stretched out bit. That's important because that makes it easiest for them to access the most sunlight. You don't want them to be bunched up too much, right? Because then a lot of them will shade each other. In this way, the current stretches them out from the air bladder. And then there's this huge like solar panels of, of kelp blades over the surface. And they're harvesting sunlight and turning it into food. Beautifully efficient. So now we're going to put other blades on. It's not just one blade. Here's where you can kind of have fun and put lots and lots of blades in different ways that you want. I'm going to show you one way to do it, uh, and then you can do your own. Uh, each of these little bumps on the surface of the of the uh, the air bladder contains several blades. So we're going to do this. We're just going to make several blades in there. These kind of flexibly float around, um, and and some of them are behind others. So you see that I've kind of left little gaps um, because not all of it. You can see because some of them uh, kind of get in the way of seeing the other ones behind them. Um, think of it as a big mass of long fettuccine-like tentacles uh, coming off these little bumps on the surface of the uh, of the air bladder of this kelp, bull kelp. Um, and actually, if if we had some more experts here. They could tell you why this is called bull kelp. I'm actually not entirely sure why the common name bull kelp was uh, was chosen. Uh, perhaps somebody has that answer actually in the chat. Even <laughs> I'll, I'll bet you somebody does. Uh, but uh, there we can get interactive. I don't know why it's called bull kelp, but it is called bull kelp. And bull kelp is neat because of this particular feature of having these bunch of long blades. Uh, Flexible blades come off this single large air bladder. Now, there are other kelp, as I mentioned, giant kelp, which we also have here, and we even have lesser giant kelp to make things even more interesting, slightly smaller. Giant kelp have many of these air bladders. They have a long stipe, that long tentacle-like part that, um, that, uh, that comes up all the way to the surface, but they have a bunch of these air bladders along it, and then each of those air bladders has one blade. Uh, so it's arranged differently, but the overall effect is still to raise the, the parts of the kelp that use sunlight higher up from the bottom of the ocean. So it doesn't just settle on the bottom and just kind of, you know, push around on the, on the, on the bottom being useless because it doesn't have as much access to sunlight. These are functioning like plants, even though they're not plants. They need sunlight. So, so here we, go. we actually uh, got the answer in the oh, chat. Yes. It's yes. called bull kelp because it looks like a bull whip, which is oh, a... there you go. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Courtney, you. for uh, sharing that answer with us. Yes, many thanks for that. So that makes sense. If you've ever seen a bull whip, right? Um, uh, it's like if you hold a whip, it's got like that the part that you can have in your hand that's that stiff, and then it's got this long, flexible bit, right? Kind of like the stipe of the kelp. But a bull whip is neat in that at the very end of that long, flexible bit. There's a, a, a sort of a tangle of rope, and it's got a bunch of little uh, bits of rope that come off that. And so it's it's more effective. It, it actually, it's, it's a function of a whip is to slap things, right? And this slaps more effectively because it's got more of those little bits at the end, and it also has more um, momentum, more inertia at the end, so it, it, it hits harder. But it looks that particular way, and bull kelp looks like a bull whip. Makes sense. Thank you very much. <laughs> so this is the wonderful bit of, interactive um, teaching. Sometimes uh, teachers don't know all the answers, but somebody else does often. And so we kind of uh, pool our resources. So there is the part of our kelp that is floating and the parts that are going to be using sunlight, those long blades. Now there's another important part to kelp. Uh, and we're gonna show this by drawing in some of the seabed. I'm just gonna move over this bit here. This, um, my uh, toolbar. We're going to draw a little bit of the seabed here on the lower left corner. You know, it's kind of a rough, kind of a, a rocky seabed maybe, and leave a little bit of a dotted line there because we're going to put something there. And just kind of like this, just roughly. It doesn't have to be any particular shape. You can even put a few like rough little lines here and there to show the roughness of the surface. That's the sort of the empty seabed. 
it would be very uninteresting if there weren't kelp forests around, relatively speaking. Um, you get some life that, that inhabits it, for sure, and you have interesting kinds of life in some ecosystems. But in the areas where kelp forests occur, kelp forests create such an incredibly diverse ecosystem, including on the, the bottom, on these, these rocks or other, um, and it would, it would have to be rock rockish type of material where kelp forests develop because of what we're just going to talk about now, and that is how kelp uh, individuals attach themselves to the bottom. Okay? So we're going to draw another kelp individual coming and, and we can't see the top of this because it's it's way, way, way above us. We've already seen what the top looks like in this kelp here that is floating uh, in the current. But this one, we're going to draw a line that comes from the upper left corner. This is another one of these stipes, right? This, this kind of kelp stem. And it's behind the other one. So you can just, you know, don't overlap it too much. Just leave a gap where, you're, where it crosses over the one that you already drew because it's behind it. So here it comes. There's the stipe. There's the thickness of it. Um, and we go down to the bottom and we end just before we hit the benthos or the bottom of the seabed. Why? Because now there's a really, really neat structure that kelp has. It is called a holdfast. The, the, the description or the name sounds like exactly what it does. It holds the kelp fast to the bottom. So basically it's a series of stiff tentacle-like structures that come off of the stipe or stem. And then they basically grow around objects like rocks and they anchor the kelp to the seabed very, very securely. Now, in heavy storms, some of these can be washed out anyway and, and broken free. And that's why we have kelp floating and ending up uh, washed out onto the beach sometimes because it does happen. But most of them stay in place quite effectively. And so here's what it looks like. If the blades of the kelp resemble fettuccine, then the holdfast components resemble spaghetti. Uh, so imagine a whole mass of spaghetti coming out of the bottom of this long tentacle. And it looks kind of like this. And they branch, uh, they're, they're like narrow little bits and they branch around. And then they just kind of embrace the rocks on the bottom. They just basically tightly envelop them and just grow around them. And it's like a bunch of fingers, like little fingers grabbing the stuff on the bottom and growing around it and holding the kelp fast to the bottom by this hold fast. And so unlike plants, these are not roots. In plants, roots function um, largely to take in water and nutrients from the soil, right? Plants get sunlight through their leaves, uh, and then they take in carbon dioxide through their leaves as well, which they then convert into sugars. But kelp, um, don't need to take up water because there's water all around them. So they actually take all the water they need from the ocean around them. And the holdfast doesn't function to pick up water or nutrients. All it does is anchor the kelp to the bottom. And so that's a big difference between the holdfast of kelp and the roots of plants. But the roots of a plant also hold it in place in the soil, right? So that winds don't blow it away or water when it rains, don't, doesn't wash it away. So in that sense, the whole fast of kelp is similar to the roots of plants. So to part of the function of roots. So you see, it's kind of like a bunch of massive spaghetti, branching spaghetti, let's call it. Kind of like branching spaghetti uh, coming out in a mass, but it's stiff. It's really stiff and hard. And it, if you've ever found any kelp on the, washed up on the beach, you probably noticed how hard and stiff this part is at the very end of that tentacle-like uh, thing, which is called the stipe, right? So there it is. It's attaching to, and you can imagine there's some rocks and other structure underneath that that it's holding, grabbing really tightly. Okay, so that's the bottom end, and that's what you would expect to be at the end of this kelp that we drew before as well. But that's way down that way. Okay? So right now we're seeing parts of two different kelp. Sorry, I, I know that the, the audio kind of breaks up when I use the eraser like that, so I'm going to minimize that. <laughs> uh, so here we go. We have two kelp individuals, but we are in a kelp forest. Some regions are really well, uh, have conditions that are really good for the development of large numbers of kelp individuals. This is where we have forest development. Cold water is necessary, usually about 6 to 14 ish degrees Celsius. Uh, kelp can take up to 18 or maybe 20. They start to die above around 20 or so degrees. And that's really, really hot for the ocean. 
The ocean is typically very much colder than most of the bodies of water that we swim in, at least around here in the Pacific Northwest. It's not like tropical areas. And the temperature is very consistent. It doesn't change much. That's very important. It's a, a very consistent, very small amount of variation. It doesn't change much normally. So it provides a beautifully stable environment in temperature wise for kelp, which need low temperature, but they also need nutrient rich conditions. Water has to be full of nutrients. And so we have that here in our Pacific Northwest waters. And you'll often find that cold water tends to have more nutrients than warm water, partly because warm water is, uh, has conditions where bacteria can grow rapidly and consume nutrients really effectively. Cold water sort of prevents a lot of that growth from happening. And so a lot of the nutrients are retained in the water. And for organisms or beings like kelp that need high nutrients, that's a wonderful uh, set of conditions, okay? So keep that in mind. But we're going to draw a bunch of other kelp around because it's a forest that we're making. And in fact, I would encourage you, if you have, a, there's a one fun uh, project you could make it in a classroom, for example. So a note possibly to teach us for an idea. You could build your own little kelp forest or little models of kelp forest. If you, you know, take these kinds of kelp drawings and then cut them out, make entire kelp out of, let's say, poster uh, paper, then you could like build up kelp forests in a little mini aquarium if you wanted to kind of suspend them by string. And you could create a model of a kelp forest and then put little models of fish or whatever in them. Kind of a fun thing to do. If, if, if kids like to do that, sometimes we like to build models. I would love to build models as a kid. I still do now if I can. Uh, you can do that and you can better appreciate how thick this forest is. But for now, we're going to draw the kelp uh, stipe. So for this, do it lightly, because in the distance through the water, you can only see so far, much, much uh, closer than in air, that the, um, the images kind of um, are obscured by the water. Light doesn't travel as well through water, and so you, you can't see as far through water as through the air. So we're going to actually only see the closer kelp. This, the kelp uh, individuals go much farther out than what we can see, but we're going to see a few close ones. So do this lightly, though, because um, in general, these don't appear as, as, as high contrast as they would in the air. They don't appear as brightly or um, against the background because again, the water obscures our vision quite a bit. So there's another stipe of another individual and there's a hold fast at the bottom attaching to rocks. You can just do this roughly kind of squiggles because it's in the distance. We don't see as much detail. We artists tend to do this. We get away with a lot, of, a lot less detail in distant objects that we're drawing because we've drawn sort of a closer one and, and our brain kind of fills in details when we see similar patterns or similar objects in the distance. It's like, aha, I know what that looks like. So I'm just gonna fill in the details even if it looks a bit rougher in the background one. And then some of these kelp in the distance have not only the stipe that we see um, and maybe the holdfast at the bottom, you can do this roughly, you know, just kind of sketch it in. But at the top, you can actually even see that air bladder and, and then the blades. And the blades, when they're at the top, remember I mentioned, they spread out with the current. So this is also a nice thing when kelp grow in an area with current, like here, you get this wonderful way in which their blades are spread out so that these long blades can use the sun's rays efficiently, harvest that light, and use it for energy that is required to build um, sugar molecules so that the kelp can use that to... Um, grow more kelp, <laughs> more blades, more stipes and hold fast, air bladders, more uh, ability to make more of itself. It's a wonderful snowball effect. That's what life is in life for that. It, it's, it's spectacular how it grows. So you can just do a bunch of these. Uh, you, we can do a bunch of them later as well. You can fill it out and, and these don't have to be in exact positions. You don't want them to be all equal distant from each other either. Some can be closer, some can be farther. And how, how they're, distributed, how they're organized underwater, really depends on a couple of things. One of them has to do with something we're going to talk about called the alternation of generations. It's a big uh, sort of a term, but this is something, and again, you can read wonderful uh, writing about that on Jackie Hildering's uh, 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 blog posts, The Marine Detective. She does some wonderful writing about the alternation of generations. Help the big, the big tree-like bits that we see those are one generation. There's like, it's like, uh, for example, uh, me, 
I, I versus my parents. Uh, my parents are another generation. I am one generation. The Celt that we see is one generation. But there's another generation that sort of gave birth to them, so to speak. Uh, and that your parents look like you overall. Like, you know, you're different size if you're younger. But as humans, we look a lot like our, our parents when we mature. Kelp are neat. They're different. The parents of these tall tree-like things were microscopic. They are, they're, they're very different cellularly as well. They only have one set of genes, not two sets of genes like you and I do. And the parents of those microscopic, tiny little filaments that grow all over the bottom of the, of the ocean, the parents of those were in turn these giant tree-like things. So it goes from giant tree uh, kelp to mini uh, tiny filaments all over the bottom to giant tree the tiny filaments, it goes back and forth, back and forth. And this is, it alternates between these two kinds of generations that look very different from each other. And this is called the alternation of generations. So there's always bull kelp around uh, at all times of the year, but mostly it's in parts that you don't, or, or when it's in the winter, it's in, in the form that you don't generally see as large. Uh, they, however, reproduce with each other and they create these giant, or they, they create the offspring, which are these giant kelp like. Uh, uh, structures, the tree-like structures, which are there in the spring and summer. And bull kelp is an annual. It dies back in the winter. And so you don't have these forests around in the winter, but only in the spring and summer and fall when they, they grow incredibly fast, like 20 or 30 centimeters per day. Insanely fast, amazing. Uh, and then they have to do that so they can reach these enormous heights of 20 meters or so uh, to the surface but then they die off at the end of the year. Now we have this amazing dynamic kelp going back and forth in size, but <clears throat> the forest itself, where the forest exists, uh, continues to repeatedly show up because the populations of those microscopic kelp uh, have, have to still be there. Now, what else? What do these forests do? And this is where it gets fun, where we talk about the interaction of them. Well, they provide, just like a real forest, they provide homes to other animals and uh, microbes and, and tiny animals, big animals. Uh, for example, one species of fish that we covered in these workshops, these webinars uh, months ago was the Boccaccio rockfish. It's a critically endangered and beautiful red colored fish that exists near our shores here in BC. And um, it uses kelp forests when it's young as kind of a, a refuge. It uh, goes there to escape from predators. So kelp forests provide a wonderful refuge or safe place for many fish species that allow them to get away from what would eat them because it's a complex environment. They can have places to hide among the stems and among the blades, very, very complex. Anytime you go into forest, you can hide behind tree trunks, similar idea here. And so you have the Boccaccio rockfish, for example. Now you can go back to the previous um, webinar featuring Boccaccio rockfish, and you can access that through Sierra Club BC's educational uh, resources. It's recorded and it's online and available. So I'm not gonna go through the details, but I'm going to draw here a Boccaccio rock fish generally. So this will be a little faster, but because we have that already as another lesson that you can access. There's the body. And then the, it's got this big mouth, big eyes, and gills. It's got these pectoral fins near the gills. It's got two dorsal fins on its back. It's got this tail or caudal fin. And this uh, underneath fin called an anal fin, and then two pelvic fins underneath. And it's got this nice lateral line. So there's our Boccaccio rockfish using the kelp forest as a way to escape from predators. Home. You also have herring that come around into kelp forests, and they lay their eggs on the kelp. And there are many different kinds of kelp, remember. So some are at the very bottom, other ones are part of the way through the water. And the herring, which I'm gonna draw a rough herring here. It sort of looks a bit like a Boccaccio rockfish, but it's got different number of fins and different overall body shape. It's a fish that uh, does a lot more swimming in open water. So the body is a little longer and narrower. 
And it also has these pectoral fins and pelvic fins and one dorsal fin and one anal fin. There we go, there's our herring. It's smaller than the Boccaccio rockfish, but this one's closer to us too. So there's perspective effects is what we call them. And then you can draw a bunch of its eggs on the, on the kelp. So on this kelp that's in the foreground, uh, I'm gonna go about here where the arrow is. I'm gonna draw a whole bunch of little, tiny little round structures. Like if you've ever seen fish eggs, um, it's like well, what you call caviar is one type of, of fish eggs, uh, sturgeon typically. But the eggs of the herring look pretty similar overall as well. They're kind of translucent, yellowish, uh, and they, they lay them in masses, large masses. So you get these masses of eggs all over the kelp, uh, various parts of its structure. So I'm just gonna put a few in like this, but when they spawn and they lay their eggs, they can be covering things. And actually it was nice. We got a, a beautiful photo uh, of, some uh, of some fish eggs on kelp from uh, Miss O'Gorman's class on uh, Haida Gwaii actually. So thank you so much for that. Uh, and you can see, if you look at, 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 if you're a diver, if you happen to be able to dive or, or snorkel or, uh, you know, cold water, but to get down to these places, sometimes in the right season, you can see fish eggs on the kelp. And it's just the really, this is the neatest thing. So here we go. We got fish laying eggs on the kelp. So kelp also functions to, you know, support these, these eggs and the babies uh, that hatch from them. So again, a wonderful place as a home. Also, kelp is eaten by animals, okay? So uh, there are herbivores uh, that, like on land, eat plants. They also eat kelp. One of the very, very imp important herbivores is called an urchin, or a, in this case, a purple urchin specifically that we're going to talk about. We have a lot of these. They're related to starfish. They're like a uh, small, almost spherical, slightly flattened spherical, and they're covered with spines. So if you've ever stepped on an urchin, you'll know what they look like in many ways. Hopefully most of us have not. Uh, they rest on the bottom of the seabed and they slowly crawl along and they eat things. Uh, one of the things they eat are kelp. They love to eat kelp. And so we're gonna draw urchins here on this rocky bottom that we drew near the, the kelp's holdfast. And what you're gonna do is uh, you can make sort of a dotted line to draw out sort of the overall shape of the body, which is round. And then you can basically just populate that with a whole bunch of spines. These spines look like this, kind of like a hedgehog or a porcupine. It's covered all around it. So that's why you really don't want to accidentally step on an urchin because that would really hurt. Some urchins actually have poison that they uh, inject from their spine. So it makes your day even worse if you step on it. Uh, but it's a wonderful protection against things for them that would eat them. Uh, and that's kind of important uh, in, in what we're just gonna talk about in a, in a couple of minutes here. There's our urchin, and maybe you can put other urchins on the edge of this um, rocky structure here that are crawling around, and they're out hunting for kelp. They love to munch on kelp. They kind of like, you know, how your uh, slugs will eat your plants. They, they move slowly, but they can do a lot of damage. Well, urchins do as well. They're not related closely to slugs, but they also move slowly and they can munch through kelp really effectively. Now, if all else was equal, if urchins were the only things here and there were kelp, they would, they would mow down kelp forests. There would be nothing left but what we call urchin barrens. Tons and tons of urchins along the bottom, no kelp forests. Why do we have kelp forests? It's kind of like back in the 60s, there was a scientist called Robert Payne, and he worked on some a fascinating bit of interaction between plants and animals. Uh, he looked at some of these marine ecosystems and, and, and looked outside and wondered why, we, why does the earth look green? Why does land look green? Why are there plants around? Why don't insects eat all the plants? Why don't urchins eat all the kelp? Uh, and, and it's a really good question, actually. Why, what keeps them from doing that? Well, it turns out that there are animals and plants, certain beings that we call keystone species. Now, if, if you know what a keystone is, um, when the Greeks built these, these beautiful arches uh, hundreds or thousands of years ago, the arches would, would not hold themselves up well unless they put a, one stone at the very apex, at the very top, that held the two halves of the arch together. And this stone would be very important. It would be a strong stone against which the two halves could lean, basically, because otherwise it would fall over. 
They lean against this, and it's called a keystone. A keystone is that stone that helps to support the arch. It's very, it's key to the, the ability of the arch to, to, to support itself. In a similar way, keystone species are animals or plants that are super important for an ecosystem. And they help to support the ecosystem. We have a very important keystone species that helps to allow kelp forests to persist. And that's a sea otter. So sea otters are out there now and they love, I mean, love to eat urchins. And so much so that they keep the population of urchins down enough that there aren't enough of them to just mow down kelp forests. So we're gonna draw a sea otter happily diving down here because they, they live on the surface often. The, if you've ever seen sea otters, they're adorable. They'll, they'll rest on the surface, uh, bellies to the sky and their little short little front paws on their chest. Uh, their little faces sort of looking around, these long whiskers. And they'll sometimes be holding an urchin with their short little stubby paws. And they're eating the urchins inside. They, they're managed to open it up, take the, the, get past those spines and eat the inside. So the urchins' uh, spines are good against many predators, but not against sea otters. Sea otters will just munch them anyway. So we have a sea otter. Sorry, I know there's going to be a little bit of a sound dis displacement there, but we have a sea otter here. Uh, and we're going to draw this little noodle-like sea otter, otter come down. It's a chubby little, beautiful little thing. Huge, actually, for otters. They're a huge otter. They grow up to 1.5 meters long. They're heavy. And they have incredibly thick, dense fur, which protects them against the cold of our waters. There's the body, chunky little body. The head is also a little, you know, roundish little head like that. It's kind of looking at us. So I'm going to give it two eyes like that. It's got this little black nose. Really adorable. They're beautiful animals. Uh, and then it's got these on the snout. It's got gigantic whiskers really really effective at um at detecting things kind of like your cat's whiskers if you have a cat but really much thicker it's like a it's like a really stiff mustache okay and there's the head and then it's got as i mentioned these short little stubby arms because they don't walk around on land very much uh sea otters spend almost all their time on the water most of the time on the surface. And in fact, they use kelp blades to hold themselves from floating away often. They also hold hands when they sleep. It's really adorable. Like they'll form these chains of otters that uh, hold hands with each other. And so you have these bunch of otters holding their hands and sleeping. But they also use those kelp blades to help secure them in place so this, that they can stay in the place where they know they're going to have food because sea urchins love to eat kelp. If you hang around kelp, you'll find sea urchins. So it's a good marker. So there's the head in front part of the body. And then we've got the hind legs, which are much better developed. And they have these long flippers for feet, basically. And they use those to help pump them through the water. They use them like, like a diver would use their flippers. Uh, really effective at, uh, at pushing themselves through the water. And then they've got this sort of muscular tail that comes out the back like that. Thick muscular tail. So there's our sea otter diving down and looking for sea urchins. And it loves these urchins. It's not intending to, to, to keep their numbers down. That's not the purpose that it's attempting to accomplish, but it does so anyway because it eats them. So in the past, when sea urchins were hunted almost to extinction for their fur, because remember I mentioned they have this incredibly dense coat of fur, the densest uh, fur of any animal, I think, of any mammal. Uh, it's really effective at keeping water out from their skin so that they can remain uh, warm enough. They have this little layer of air around uh, their, their skin so that they can effectively sort of keep dryish. They were hunted almost to extinction for this fur. And when that happened, kelp forest practically vanished from the Pacific Northwest because sea urchins were not kept in check. They kept eating the kelp, mowing down these forests and all of the life that depended on these wonderful kelp forests also suffered. Uh, we have a term uh, in biology called co-extinction. Sometimes when you remove one animal, when it goes extinct, as sea, er as sea otters almost did, it can cause the extinction or the complete die-off of whole other species because these species that, that are led to extinction 
were important to support an entire ecosystem. And without them, without these keystone species, the whole ecosystem and many species that completely depend on only that ecosystem can die off and go extinct. Uh, and co-extinction refers to species of beings that go extinct because of another one that has gone extinct that they depended on. Okay? So that is something that we have to be very careful to prevent. To do that, we have to preserve these kelp forests. One of the, the, the dangers that they face these days is even bigger than, than hunting of sea otters. As we are pumping a lot of carbon dioxide into our atmosphere because we're using fossil fuels to burn for fuel, the planet is warming because it traps, the carbon dioxide traps heat from the sun and doesn't allow it to escape. Our climate is changing as a whole, right? You've heard of climate change, uh, the increasing temperature of the planet overall. Well, what that's doing is the oceans are also warming. Remember I mentioned that oceans have to remain between a very, very narrow range of temperatures for kelp, this cold temperature. Well, if the oceans warm, that's not good for kelp, they suffer. They become weaker, they grow less, they die more, and kelp forests start to vanish. The last few years, we've had these, um, you may have encountered the term, uh, the blob. The blob was a huge region of water off our coast to the west that was warm. It, it was a strange phenomenon that developed as a result partly of the planet's overall increased uh, heating. And that increased heating overall causes certain regions to heat up even more due to local conditions uh, causing that. And the blob was one of these, it happens sometimes, these masses of water that are warmer overall and they move as a whole. And when the blob hit the West Coast near where these shallow waters where the kelp usually love their cold water environments, it caused the water to warm up too much. And now we're starting to see a lot of kelp forests suffering and dying out because of the overall warm water and several of these heating events like the blob. So one of the things we have to do as a whole, regardless of where we live, is do our best to reduce our pumping out of carbon dioxide, these greenhouse gases, so as they're called, into the atmosphere so that we can slow down the warming of our planet and allow it to start cooling back down again to a point where you know, the oceans, for one thing, won't be threatened by being too warm for kelp and many other species that require cold water. So climate change is a big threat to kelp uh, forests. And kelp forests are crucially important for our fishing industries, even for our, ourselves, not just for other species. Uh, recently, it was determined, uh, some study, some researchers did a, a sort of, they tried to figure out how much kelp was worth to our economies. And they came up with this figure, when you add up everything, including how much they help fish uh, to survive, because we eat fish, about $500 billion. That's half a trillion dollars. It, nobody can comprehend that number, but it's worth just to us humans, potentially that much or more. That's, and it was an underestimate, that at least that much. So we need kelp forests for us to do well as well, not just other species. But we also, also other species need that as well. And what we want to do is think empathetically and compassionately. We need to think in ways more than just about ourselves. We want others to do well, right? Our, our classmates, our neighbors, our families, our, our bigger, like wider out neighbors, uh, our, our, um, our, our other, other species of beings that are our neighbors. It feels wonderful when we do things that help them. Uh, and that's something that's important. That's built into us. We are a social species. We need others around us to interact with. And one of the nice effects of that is it feels good to do good things to others and including others of other species, beings of other species. So let's do that. It, it helps us to feel good and it helps us to survive because we, in helping other species and other ecosystems in which we live, will end up benefiting us as well because we suddenly have more food available. We have cooler temperatures because the trees in our, our cities help to cool things down. This heat wave that we're experiencing will feel a lot less uncomfortable. We won't sweat as much or feel lethargic because the trees are keeping us cooler. Uh, that's just one example. When we help others, we help ourselves. That's the bottom line. And I want to see, what would inspire me the most is to see this, you folks, you children especially, who are listening to this, you 
it's hard to tell you how wonderful it is to see when you become involved in ways to help our uh, planet, the living part of our planet survive better. Mm -hmm. And those of us who are, who are excited to do that will do everything we can to help as well. But to see you do that, to see you get involved in projects uh, with your school, with your family, individually, with your friends, to help out, to make a better uh, planet for, for everything that's alive is wonderful. And there's so many things you can do from, you know, helping to clean up shorelines from plastic debris to helping spread the word to your family and friends and others about trying to reduce our use of fossil fuels, you know, drive our cars less if we can, uh, do things to buy things that involve less uh, sending things around by airplanes so that we have less carbon dioxide in the atmosphere from the fuel usage, all kinds of things. Uh, we're helping others and we're helping ourselves. So this is our kelp forest here. Uh, you can keep adding more kelp to it as well. You can color these in. Hey, you can even send these in letters, illustrated letters to um, to your uh, local government representatives, your mem members of legislative assembly, your M MLAs or your MPs, your members of parliament. Tell them why you love kelp forests and why it's so important for us uh, to have kelp forests around and what we want them to do to, to formulate policies in government, laws that help to protect these kelp forests better. Uh, if we can do that, then we're going to have a much better chance of doing it. And believe me, I have seen it myself and many of us have seen it who are actively involved in conservation. We make a huge difference when we work together. Individuals can and groups can even more so, so much more than you'd imagine. If anybody tells you that what you're doing doesn't matter, don't listen to that because many people don't know because they haven't seen the difference that it can. I've seen my personally myself, how much a difference it can make. So draw, draw kelp, uh, spread the information to your friends, show them how excited you are about the, the wonderful things that you learn about these ecosystems. And let's work together in class projects and otherwise to help to make our future generations of, of, of people to be able to enjoy these kelp forests and to be able to dive with them and to see how beautiful they are and to have all the fish around as well and everything else that lives with them. So that's all I have to say. Uh, Maya, uh, I'll give it back to you. Um, thank you everybody for participating. Uh, it's such an exciting thing to be able to do these drawing webinars and I hope that you guys enjoyed yourself and I hope that uh, you'll join us for future ones. Thanks so much, Julie. It's for another fantastic session. So wonderful to learn all about all the deep interconnections of this beautiful ecosystem. Um, so as people are signing off, I just wanted to let folks know that I know this was a lot of information and you might want to go back and continue drawing. So tomorrow I'll be sending out an email with a video recording, as well as some of the great links that were shared today, um, including the links to the marine detectives work, as well as how you can send some of this beautiful artwork to your MLA, which I highly recommend, um, such a high impact way that art can drive change. And we'd also love to feature your work on our website. Um, if you send your drawings to us at social at sierraclub.bc.ca, which I'll include that email link um, in the follow-up email, we'd love to feature your artwork. Uh, thanks so much for carving out time in your day today, everyone, to get creative with us and learn a bit more about these wonderful ecosystems. And as always, we'll be coming out with more sessions in the future, so stay tuned uh, to keep drawing with us. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Take care, everyone.